And Thomas said, I will not pistioso him Service of Holy Eucharist Rite 2 begins on page 355 in the Book of Common Prayer, page 355. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal Mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Acts. When the temple police had brought the apostles, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them saying, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. And yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus whom you had killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
<clears throat> Today's Psalm is 150, we will read in unison. Hallelujah, praise God in his holy temple. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his excellent greatness. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with lyre and harp. Praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Second reading is from Revelations. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. When it was evening of the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. 
Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So here we are, a week later. It's ready to go again. So I know last week you were here on Sunday. You were here on Easter Sunday. We're coming out of Lent and Holy Week. And as you heard the gospel, and as you listened to the psalm, and as you sang the music, you were all ready to jump up out of your seat and jump into the aisle and dance around. And you couldn't wait to get out of here for all the right reasons. And it was fantastic. And here you're ready to go again. Calm down. Stay where you are. <laughs> so as we read the gospel, we read what's going on. There are two, two sections in this gospel that have brought us a full seven days. Because you'll notice as the gospel starts off, it's the first day of the week. It's the morning of the resurrection. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house of the disciples were met were clocked for fears of the Jews. So this is... This is the, the day of the, this is the day of the resurrection. The day has gone by, and it is evening. The people they've met, they've met. And something's happening. You can see that they are meeting because there is an event that has taken place, right? They have heard something. Some news has come to them. And it news was from the women. The women went out to the tomb. They went out to the tomb to do something. They were there carrying their little tote bags, their baskets, right? They got that good shopping bag, the one that you could take that doesn't have to go to the landfill. They were carrying something. What were they doing? Why were they there? Wasn't it weird? Have you stopped to think about it? Why were they going to the tomb? You know, when we bury somebody, what do we do? Well, what we used to do. Not many people do it anymore. When you put a family member into the cemetery and you put the headstone there, then we used to go every Sunday after church with a little bit of flowers or something else, and we'd put them on the grave because that's what we did. It was a respectful thing to do. My father died. We went every Sunday for a while. But the cemetery is a far way away. So was that what they were doing? Were they going to put flowers on the grave? Okay. Let's stop and find out what they were doing, because this is incredibly important. Now, let's think about what's happening in the first century. You, don't, you, you, you hear Jesus talking about the whitewashed tombs and the graveyard that's across the Kidron Valley from, from the Temple Mount, right? And he's talking to, who is he talking to in those scriptures? He's talking to the rich Jewish authorities that lived at the time, and they had this burial place right across from the temple because they were special and needed to be near the temple. And they had these tombs that they built, and a lot of the whitewashed tombs because they used marble and other, other materials to dress up this area. But that's not what Jesus got. That's not normal. That's not for everybody else. Even the rich people, like Joseph of Arimathea, right, who didn't have a whitewashed tomb, who didn't have a place in, in the Kidron Valley right across from, from uh, the Temple Mount, they would use the, the ancient and traditional way, which is to create a cave, they would hew out in the rock a cave, and they would use that cave to bury their family. So we know this is what happened. They took Jesus down from the cross, and they took him right across the little valley, right where it was, and they put him into the cave. Okay, so what is going on? Well, to understand what's going on, you have to understand what's going on. So I'm going to tell you what it was that he was put into and why the, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection could only happen the way that it happened. Couldn't happen any other way. Okay, and that's why I'm going to explain to you what the, what the tomb was. The tomb, I'm going to use my hand. The tomb looks just like my hand, okay, like this, okay? Now, imagine that my hand, the wrist, my wrist is the opening to the tomb, right here. So this is the, this is the, the tomb door, okay? So this is the rock face, 
And right here is the tomb door. Now, who's seen a, who's seen a Jesus movie where they roll away the tomb, right? And you got these guys and they're moving the stone. And it's, you know, this big around because then they go up and then they walk in and they look and there's usually like a, a, like a bed over here on the right side where Jesus is supposed to be laying. It's a beautiful image. It really is. It's a beautiful image. You go to Jerusalem, you will see the, the, um, the tourists get directed to this tomb and it looks just like this. It's in a beautiful garden and you walk in the door and the big, the, the, the rolling, it's called a rolling stone tomb. The stone is rolled away and you can see the bed. Now, um, just now, I don't know, I didn't look this up. I, I used to know it, but um, can you imagine how much are a stone that is 18 inches deep, six feet tall, and seven feet around would weigh? Now, let's go one step further. This stone is in a track that's built for the stone that's up against the face of the rock. And when you get just past where the stone is, so the stone is here, there's a speed bump, literally a speed bump, that you have to roll the stone over to open it. So that when you roll it back, it'll go clunk and get slammed. Why? because two guys couldn't roll this stone on the best day of any week of any year ever. The stone weighs tons. So how big is a stone that people could actually move and probably would use it, move it with a winch. And how would they do that? You'd have a, a crevice in the stone that they'd hook a rope into. The rope would go over the stone and you'd get on this side and pull and the stone would roll up until it hit the top of that speed bump then go clunk. How big was that stone? Even that stone itself would weigh 300 pounds, 400 pounds. It's about this big. So the rolling stone tomb that you'd go into with that door, that door is about two feet tall. You would crawl into this stone. You would, hands on your feet, hands and knees, crawl into the, in the once you got inside, the inside, and that hole is only made small because the, it, it, the, the, the door is just too big. You make the door bigger, you can't get it open, I don't care. So once you get inside, that's my hand, right? You've gone through the hole, you go into the then section, I have to turn my hand over. The inside of the tomb is shaped like my hand turned over. The palm of my hand has got a dent in it, right? So when you get into the tomb, you can probably go like this, or you can stand up a little bit, you can get on your knees like this, the roof's right here. And right in the center of the tomb right here, there's a dent shaped like a person, like a, like a big trough. It only needs to be about maybe five, six inches deep. Why? Well, because they're gonna anoint the body. They're gonna put spices on them. They're gonna pour oil on the body. And that oil is gonna get caught in the trough so you're not kneeling in a bunch of oil and sliding all over inside of this cave. It's gonna be down here. And perhaps that when you're done, you can mop it up. It's right there. And when they put the body in here, they're gonna lay the body out and they're gonna then take the body and wrap it like a mummy. And then they're gonna put, well, I'm sorry. First, they're gonna put down a shroud. It's gonna go from about 18 inches past the end of their feet. They're gonna be, heads gonna be facing the cave. Their feet are gonna be facing the door. They're gonna go about 18 inches out. They're gonna put that shroud down here and they're gonna ball it up up here. They're gonna mummify the body. Lots of, you know, Egyptian style, you know, mummy. And then they're gonna pour the oil and the spices all over the body. And then they're gonna pull that shroud over the body and they're gonna to go to the end of the feet and they're gonna wild it up. Maybe even put a stick in it and roll it around the stick. This is important, okay? Now they've got a pole, a stick, a big pole. They don't use that stick yet. They take that big piece of wood, like a board, flat and smooth on the front, and they slide it underneath this whole thing all the way down the face of the person to the top of their head. So you've got a board laying on top of them. Now, let's go to the fingers, okay? What they're gonna do is these fingers are other caves. So I build this one big body cave, and then off the cave, I build these little caves, angled down about 30 degrees. They're called Kok, it's the name of the cave. And it's only about maybe two feet around, maybe about as big as the door, just big enough to slide a body into. And they're gonna take that pole and they're gonna push the shroud, All right? Pushing the shroud is gonna pull the body and they're gonna push the body down in the hole. Then they're gonna pull that big pipe, that big, that big piece of wood out of there and they're gonna 
take that pole, that post, and they're gonna roll up the shroud, they're gonna tuck it in by the feet, and they're gonna get their brick and mortar and gonna brick up that hole. And they're gonna go away, and they're not gonna come back. Five years, seven years, there's different amounts of time. And when they come back in five years, they're gonna break down that, that brick. Now what do they do? How do I get the body out? Come on now, how do I get the body out? So, I don't know, how do I get it out of there? It's, a, it's down in a hole. Grab the shroud, that's why, you put the, that's why you put the stick in there. You grab a hold of that stick, the shroud is an envelope, that's all it is. The shroud is there so you can pull the body up out of the hole. So why are they doing that? Because this is the part we have to remember, the, the mummification process or the likelihood of it in Israel is not the same as we think about it in Egypt. Egypt, they put anointing on the body and mummified the body to preserve the body forever. We've seen those bodies. I just saw one two weeks ago. In Israel, it's exact opposite. The herbs and spices they put on the body was to break the body down fast, to completely dissolve it. Okay? And what they would do after five years is they'd break down that brick and they'd pull that shroud and they would check it. And if there was any body left, they might pour a little more spice on there, put that stick back in, slide it back down and wall it back up, God bless you. And they would wait another two years and they'd come back and do it again. When they came in there and there was no body left in that shroud, just debris and bones, they then take all that debris away, they take the bones out, they put them in an ossuary, a little box, they take that box out and they put it into a wall and they build a wall around it. Uh, like a, like a, you know, what do we have those today? Don't we put ashes in the wall? This is why about, I don't know, it's probably five years ago, you may remember the news, maybe more than that now, uh, they were doing some construction in Israel and they broke down a wall and all these boxes fell out, all these ossuaries fell out of the wall because they didn't realize it was one of those burial walls with all these little coffins that are just big enough for a thigh bone in length and then big enough around to hold the rest of the bones in the skull right in there, that's it. Why would I do that? Because it was an expensive thing to build one of these tombs. So as, an as somebody who's made my money, I'm gonna take care of my family, not just my current family, but my generations of family, my grandchildren. And this way, when you bury somebody in one of these, you know that it's just five years maybe, maybe five years or seven years later, that coke is gonna be empty so that somebody else dies, they can go in there. And if I'm rich and I have five cokes in my tomb, I can bury perhaps my whole family over generations because that, that each one of those tubes is being rotated out every four to five to seven years. So nobody is buried per, per, in perpetuity in these tombs. They are a, a holding place for them to decompose and they take their bodies and move them. Ah, okay. So now let's get to the gospel. Why this could only work when it worked. Because if Jesus was was crucified and died on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. They would have taken him down. They would have put him into the tomb. They would have dressed him as a mummy. They would have poured all the spices on him. They would have stuck him in the coke. They would have bricked it all up. They would have closed the rolling stone and nobody would have gone back to the tomb for seven years. They're done. They weren't going to, the ladies were not going to put flowers on the grave like us. They were going because they took him down and threw him in there. They put a few spices on him. Remember that? They said they put some spices on him. They were most likely putting things on him so he would not smell because they knew that a day later when the, when the Sabbath was over, the women were going to come back to dress the body. And they're going to have to get in there and do this where they would normally do it the day of. Now they were doing it days later. So this is why, anybody seen the Shroud of Turin with the image of Christ on it? This is why the image is on there, because if he had been dressed properly the day that the, of the crucifixion, he would have been wrapped up this way in sheets. There would be no image on the shroud. The shroud would have been one full layer away from his face. They came to just pull the shroud back to dress him in his garments, in his, in his mummification garments, to pour the spices and the acids on him and then leave him. And then a grave tender would come and slide him down in the coke and wall it up. So they were just finishing the job that they, were supposed to, that they were supposed to have done days ago. So you see, if he had not died on the eve of the Sabbath, there would have been nobody going to the tomb for any reason, not for five or seven years. Pretty cool, huh? So God arranged it this way because the resurrection had to be proclaimed. 
It had to be proclaimed that day, that morning. It had to be proclaimed that day, that morning, so that the disciples hearing it would gather together in the way they gather, wondering what was going on. It had to happen so they could gather together and not scatter apart, so that Christ could come in that moment and proclaim himself as resurrected to them so that everything could continue from that place on. I tell you a long time, I say this all the time, that the scriptures are all held together by flesh and blood, by living life, by the water of life, by the blood of life, by the person of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, capital W, is the words printed in the book, that they're all tied together. Remember on the road to Damascus, they said that they left, they weren't sure, and they left, and that they, Jesus met them, didn't know who he was, and he talked to them, and he said, why, what are you doing? They said, oh, where have you been? Haven't you heard that, that uh, the Master of the Lord was, was crucified and he died? And Jesus said, oh, let me, just, let me just tell you about the scripture. And then he talked to him all the way. And remember at that time when he finally got done telling him, he disappeared and they turned to each other and they said, oh, didn't our hearts just burn as he opened the words of scripture to us? What? These guys grew up on the words of scripture. These guys memorized the scripture a lot more than we have. They knew all the stuff he was saying. How come they hadn't gotten it before? Because they hadn't gotten it before. Because they had learned a Bible lesson here and a Bible lesson here and memorized this and memorized that. And they didn't properly tie them together so that all of these numbers didn't add up to a sum. And when Jesus retold the scriptures and the prophecies to them, he added everything together. And for the first time in their life, they got the answer. The answer that was there all along, but they'd never seen it. And when it came true, this, this thing, this truth, this reality that they always wanted and never had, that was at their fingertips, but they couldn't grip, their heart burst and burned within them. As they can you imagine, can you imagine the revelation as they hear the scripture, as he's piecing together the stories they know now in a way that are no longer set apart and, and these islands of tales told across the sea, but rather now one continuous body of land, body of information is now coming together. And each one that he tells is more revelatory than the last until when he's done, it's like the picture for the first time. So do they keep going? No, no, because they had the answer. They turned right around and went back. They said, we, we got to go back. We can't go away. We have to go too. This is our lot in life. This is our call in life. This is the everything of our life is to go back, to get it right this time, to do it right. It's never too late to do it right, is it? Didn't mom and dad tell us that? It's never too late to do the right thing. Never. Nobody said it would be easy. I remember mom, she ever said, Billy, it's going to be easy to do the right thing. Who would have believed their mother if they said that? Nobody who's like older than four. Never too late to do the right thing. And it's going to be so hard that it's going to build character because character is really important. Good character leads to a development of integrity. And integrity carries with it honesty and, and morality and fidelity and care and concern and compassion. So yeah, so they had gone to the disciples and said, hey, he's resurrected, he's gone. And Peter's in this room with, with Johnny saying, what are you talking about? Oh my gosh, okay, you go run away and tell everybody and we're gonna get the guys together. So they get to the disciples together, and they're in the room, they're up around, they're going, did you hear what they said? Do you think they're okay? I mean, they went to, the, they went to somebody's, I mean, what's going on? Are the Jews, did you hear this? They're not, this is not, they're in the upper room, they're not afraid of the Romans. I'm not saying they were locked in the upper room for fear of the Romans. Romans crucified Jesus. Well, they did it begrudgingly, if we think about Pilate's trying to let him go. It was the Jews, right? They're the ones that had crucify him, crucify him. They wanted it done. So they're in the upper room for fear of the Jews. Something bad has happened. They know that the Jews don't want Jesus resurrected because that just can perpetuates the myth. Now he's more than a man. But if this has happened, if they've stolen the body or something else, if it really is a resurrection, they're going to come after them next. They're going to want to get rid of all the witnesses from the start to the finish. So they're hiding in this room with the door locked. And in the midst of this thing, Jesus comes to him and he stands there. And what's the first thing he says? Peace. Peace where? 
in you. Look at you. You must be a singer. You know, people in the choir get to sing the, Christ the scriptures twice. It's a spiritual thing that happens when you're in the choir. Because you hear the words here, and then when it changes, when this becomes music, and you sing them, you have to, you have to live them in your breath. Live them in your voice. And if you are willing to hold on to that moment, you are, you are encapsulated in that growth of, of music, of spiritual music. This singing is praying twice. It's going through it twice. So are you a singer? <laughs> How did I? <laughs> yeah, and if you're not a singer, if you're not in the choir, you should join the choir because that is not limited to the people who are already in the choir. It is something that happens when you sing, not only here in the pew, but all the more when you are in the choir. To sing is to pray twice, is to be revealed twice, is to grow in Christ twice, just in that moment. What a blessing it is to be in the choir. Would it be that all of us were simply the choir, right? So yeah, go up there. Look, I see an empty seat. Go up in there. Go up in the choir. All right, so they've come to him. Jesus stands there and he says, peace, where, when? Out there in the world with the Jews that are trying to kill you or not. I don't know. No, he didn't say that. He said, peace to you. You don't need to worry about what's going on out there right there. You don't have to worry about who is manipulating who. You don't have to worry about conspiracy. <laughs> conspiracy. Oh, what a waste of time. You do not need to worry about all of that. You know where the peace needs to be found? Right here. If you have peace in here, that's, the conspiracy is not going to do anything. If you have peace in here, there's not going to be a fear about what's going on there. Is that going to change them coming to kill you? No, it's not. But you're going to find peace, even if that happens. The peace that passes all understanding. The peace that lifts you above this thing. Remember they say you kill the body once. Spirit lives on forever. It may be horrible in that moment. I won't doubt it. It certainly has been for so many billions of people throughout history. But it only happens once. And then there is life eternal and life of bliss and life and joy and life and happiness and life and felicity with those whom we love who have gone before us. He said, no, not out there. In here. Peace. Peace to you. Oh my gosh. All right. Then he keeps going. He says, it just says blah, blah, blah. He goes on. He says, and then he says it again. He showed his hands and his feet, right? They didn't move. They didn't do anything. They just stood there. And then he says it again. Peace be with you. And then he free. Can you imagine? Okay. You guys are disciples right now, right? He's Jesus has come to you and he's standing right here and you know, everything that's happened. You just had the, you just had the crucifixion like three days ago and he's been buried. You don't know what's going on. And, and Jesus says to you, he says, as the father sent me, now I send you. I think in my worst, I would be thinking. <laughs> All right. So he says, peace be with you. So this is, so he's carrying this on. He says, that's not just. It's not just you out there. This is where we go. We say, I'm all alone. I'm all alone. I can't do this. I can't do it. Jesus is saying, no, no, no. As, didn't you hear me? As the Father sent me, I send you. And remember the scripture, I and the Father are one. When he says, Yudi, why do you keep asking for the she to see the Father? But you've seen me. You've seen the Father. See how the scripture is coming together. He's going to keep doing this. He's going to keep pulling these island pieces of scripture that he's talked to him about all this time into this one moment, into this one review of life. So he says, I send you, he says, and then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. He says, it breathed on them. And they says, when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Can you think in your mind another time it was really recent when Jesus breathed and something about his spirit happened? Yeah, well, for us, it was a week ago. For them, it was three days ago. From the cross, it says, he breathed his last and his spirit left him. Now he is breathing on them and giving the spirit to them. You think this was a, a revelation moment for the disciples? We call this the little Pentecost. 
Jesus has done something to them now. It's not the full-blown speaking in tongues and going out and doing that. And we're getting to that in just some days, some 30 days away. Right now it's saying he breathed on them and he gave them to receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says this thing that fries everybody. And it should fry us all. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Ugh. That's a pretty horrible superpower to have. Can you imagine the chance for corruption? If I have the super, I'm just Marvel. It's a Marvel universe. Got a, got a movie contract right here. If I forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. But if I retain your sins, <laughs> do you think we would ever be, be corrupt enough to, to use that the wrong way? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a little 101 on church history. Let's go back to the Inquisition. Anybody ever hear that? <laughs> How many little inquisitions versus the big inquisition that killed thousands of people for absolutely no reason except for that they weren't giving enough money to the church? You don't give money because you're sinning. You don't give money because, because you are hoarding it or, or you're hoarding it because you're sinning. And the way to cure the hoarding of your money is to kill you because I can get all your money by killing you and I'll make an example of you to your neighbor and then you'll give me the rest of it. The church has abused the idea of forgiving sins for so long, it's ridiculous. Because why? Because we are corrupt and broken human beings who do this kind of thing all the time. We get swept away in the idea of my power and my authority and my brain and my knowing and my stuff, and we will abuse any authority that anybody gives us along the way as long as it makes us feel better. Sometimes we do it quite maliciously and on purpose, and other times we do it just because it just wheedles its way into our life. I just need to feel important, doggone it. I don't feel important anymore, but I've got this authority, so if I just do this one thing, I'll feel important, and I feel much better now. But that's not what this is saying. What a corruption of the church that we corrupted it twice. Not only in what it was saying, what Jesus is saying, but then in how we applied it. Jesus is saying, receive me, receive God, and through me and through God, you will proclaim forgiveness in your name. No, not in your name, in my name. You will forgive in my name. given because they are already not in a place or not ready to be in a place to be forgiven. It is not proclaiming something out of my power and my authority. It's simply identifying a situation based on authority. It makes no, this is no different than anybody who's ever held a job. Let's just make it really graphic and, and logistical. Anybody who's ever had a job where the job says your job is to go in with this lady right here and make sure that she's doing her job right on the assembly line. And if she's not doing her job right, you've got to stop her. Why? Because you know everything in the whole wide universe. No, because you've got a little piece of paper right here that says for her to be doing her job right, she has to do A, B, C, D, E, and F in that order. And I go there and I look at her and she's skipped A, B, and C. And that's why the little products that are coming out down there haven't got feet. So I have to stop the assembly line and she's going to get corrected or fired. If she doesn't, if I correct her and she keeps doing it, she's going to get fired. Her sin is not going to be forgiven because she's not repentant because she hasn't gone back and started doing A, B, and C. Maybe she didn't know she wasn't doing it. Maybe she needed an education. Maybe she knew and didn't care. And that's why she's going to get fired because I can't make her care. She's going to do what she's going to do, and she's going to get fired for it. And the company, I'm not going to care as the company. I may be sad for her as a person. So Jesus is saying, this is the authority I give to you. The authority I give to you is to witness to me. What are you now? What are you now? What did he just do? You are the church. You are the church. You are my hands and feet in the world. You are for me. You are my mouth. You are my eyes. You are taking my life and you are taking it to others and you are giving it away and you are leading them to me because where is life found? Life is found in me. Do we find this happening in the scripture anywhere else today? Oh, I think it did. It says that the temple police had brought the apostles. This is well after the, the book of uh, the, uh, the, uh, Pentecost in the first reading in chapter five of the book of Acts. And they, the temple police took them to the high priest. They said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And Peter responds to him and says, we must obey God rather than you, for we are the church. 
We are the witnesses of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you can tell us to stop all day long, but that's not who we are anymore. We are not your toadies. We are not listening to you about this. We are telling and doing what we have been called to do. We have been anointed by God. He has breathed on us. He has named us as the church, and he has sent us out to do his will. And we are going to do that. We are the holy. Ch- we are the church. And it says, and so, so this is the Holy Spirit whom God has given. We must obey. We are in a partner in, in, in companionship with the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost. And because we are the church and because we are called by God, we are going to go. You are the church. Oh, but it's a sad story, isn't it? It takes a turn for the worst. In the middle of the gospel, it says, but, (laughs) but Thomas wasn't there. He was out buying, you know what, radishes. I don't know. And when he got back, they said, ha, ha, we've seen the Lord. And he says, no, I've seen a lot of things. I've seen, I've seen people receive their sight. I've seen the lepers healed. I've seen People talk again. I've seen the crippled walk. I, 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 this is more. This is beyond anything. I, okay, yeah, I've seen Lazarus rise from the dead, but this is more than that. Okay, this is more than that. Anybody doubt this is more than that? I can't do it. And he says the thing. He says, unless I see the mark of the nails of the hands, put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand inside, I will not pestioso. What? Okay. So there are two words used for faith. One is pistos, like a pistos. And that's faith. He uses 29 times in the gospel. Jesus talks about pistos all the time. Your faith has set you free. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has, has brought you to this place. You have faith, pistos, the whole time. What that means is that I have a, a, a belief in and a faith in in something I have not seen, and it is there, and I know it's there, and I'm going to live in that place. But that is not what Thomas says. He uses his other word, pistioso. What is pistioso? It is faith as a verb. Pistos is a noun. Pistioso is a verb. And he says, I have faith in Jesus as the Christ, but I am not going to act on it. I am not going to do anything with it unless I am able to do this thing myself, because I, I am not sure. Then later on, when he sees Jesus, he says, don't doubt. That word is, is um, Distanzo, all right? Distanzo is this word that simply means uh, two minds. Two minds, two things going in my mind at the same time. And Jesus says, don't have two things in your mind. So don't do that. Believe. Again, pistos this time. So he's saying, if you believe, you have pistos, then you pistioso, you'll be able to do that. You'll have action. Jesus did not come to the disciples in the upper room and say, believe in me. Here, here's your box of bonbons. Take them home and sit in your living room and wait for me. Go ahead. Go home. Bye. He said, now that I've given you this reality of your life, go out there and do something about it. Go out there and spread the word. Go out there and let the people know. Go out there and change the world in my name. Remember the end of the, of the gospel of Matthew? Go, yes, right before the, the ascension. Go ye into the world and proclaim the gospel in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, telling everybody and bringing them to me. Your faith is not faith that lies dead on the side of the road. It is not found in your living room waiting for some miracle to happen. Faith is found in action. Faith and action in the scripture are the same thing. It it makes us move out. It makes us come together. It gets you to church so that you're here. I'm tired in the morning and my pillow is so nice. Oh my gosh. Especially in those days where it gets cool, you know, and you roll over and it wakes you for a moment because the pillow is all cold. Like, oh yeah. You go back to sleep. Who doesn't want to go back to sleep? Come on. I want to go back to sleep. But then there's another part. The other part says, get up and go. And who's that? That's the Holy Spirit. That's God saying, it's time to go. It's time to go. Gather as my people. Re be resupplied with your energy and your purpose and your intention. And then get out and change the world. And not just get out and change the world, but what was that? Where was peace found? In. Get inside and change the world. 
You need to change in order to change the world. We need to become more than the people that we are. We need to become the people that have faith in Christ that leads us out in his power. No longer afraid of being rejected for naming Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. No longer afraid of being told that I can go someplace and take my family with me because I shared the reality of Jesus Christ. Not being afraid that someone is going to disapprove of me because I follow Jesus Christ, but finding the peace inside of me, knowing that this is the truth and the reality. And maybe the people that are cursing me are the very people that are going to go home and finally, after the last 25 years of pain and grief and hardship, fall on their knees. I'm not going to know that, but I'm not called to know that. I'm only called to respond to that call to ministry. As my Father has called and sent me, I call and send you, and I go with you from now on, even until the end of the age. Forever I'm with you doing this thing. He comes right the next day. He's right. Thomas is there. Boom, pops up. First thing he says to him, right? Says, peace be with you. There it is. Shh. Thomas, come here. Put your hand here. Put your hand here. I love, the, I love the Jesus movies. Anybody? I love the Jesus movies. There's nothing in Scripture that Thomas ever put his fingers in the side or his thumb in the hand. That's for us that we see that on TV. He's like over there going. <laughs> I watched one the other night. He's like all bent over, putting his finger. Jesus is like, yeah, right there. Go in a little deeper. Feel the rib right there. No, it doesn't say that. He doesn't have to do that. Jesus says, do it. And what does he proclaim? He proclaims something that we haven't heard in scripture yet, something incredible. He says, my Lord, master, Jesus has been called master all along. Lord and master, same thing. We even have that in, in an English hierarchy, right? Lord, oh Lord, the moat is dry, Lord. Right? Jesus has been called Lord, he's master. But, Jesus, but Thomas does something else. He says, my Lord and my God. I have seen the raising of the dead and the healing of the deaf and the blind and the wholeness of the lepers. I have never seen this before. There is no explanation for this in the whole wide world. You are not simply the master. You are God. The proclamation, the first proclamation like this we find in Scripture, the one that goes out and, and comes to us today as we make the same proclamation over and over in Scripture. And Jesus says to him, have you believed because you have seen? We don't know if that is exactly the end of it. It's not simply because he has seen. It's because inside of him, there is a connection that is already established between Thomas and God. That connection has now just simply been solidified in this moment. Was the eyes that showed him? Maybe it's the eyes that showed him. Is it the spirit that confirmed? Absolutely. The spirit that confirmed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Why? Because it is written that you come to believe in Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, that through believing you may have life in his name. Not life in my name, not life in somebody else's name, not life in my accomplishments, not life in my money, not life in my possessions, life in his name. To connect all the dots of scripture together and know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, my Lord and my God. To find peace in myself because Christ has sent me in the same way that his father has sent him. I've seen Jesus Christ in my spirit and my life, and I've seen the father. When you pray and you pray with that image of Jesus Christ before you, you should see the image of the father right there. This last little bit, this little, this little page, this little thing here. You see my notes? You see, it's all, can they see the arrows? It's all connected. It's all connected. It's called a mende clause, this last little bit of the gospel. When now Jesus did many other signs, you know, mende clause is really kind of a thing said like on the one hand and then the other hand. The mende clause is always the same. On the one hand, on the other hand. So it says right here, he says, on the one hand, Jesus did many other signs with his presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. On the other hand, these are written in this book. So what is he saying here? Why, why include a mendy clause? It's kind of a weird thing to do. It's unnecessary, right? Mm. We're going to hear other things, and people are going to say, I wish I knew more. Doesn't everybody wish we knew more? Didn't we wish that the Bible was three times as long in the New Testament and had every little jot and tittle that Jesus had to ever breathe and said? I don't care if he just said, oh, that's a pretty flower. I'd love to know. I'd love to read that. I'm sure he said it, but it's not there. What he's saying is that it doesn't need to be there. The words of life that are written in this book are enough. 
We go away with questions. I don't know why. What did he say? Why did he say that? Guess what? There it is. It's, it's like on page you know, 232 of the New Testament. That's, that's what he said. But I don't know why he said, well, I just have to turn back to page 114. Travis and Christ to heal your wounds, your pain, your sorrows. Heal it. In that healing, as the church, help God to heal all of us with that. Believing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that through Him, life and peace. One God, the Father, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to love the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers the people are found on page 392. 392. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, friends and neighbors. neighbors. And for, for those who are alone. alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and the proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, sickness, or any kind of need. For the peace and the unity of the Church of God. For our bishop and for all bishops and other ministers, especially Bill and our church. For the special needs and the concerns of this congregation 
and those listed on our prayer list as part of our parish family and our extended creator family. Hear us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Give special thanks for the beauty of this weekend, for this day, and for this time to come together here. Lord, I thank you for my parish family. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And pray you for our We pray for all who have died that may, they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Remember especially the companionship and life and friendship of Doug Dooling. We pray for his family as they grieve his death, as they gather tonight for visitation. And we pray for them for peace as they celebrate his life tomorrow at the service. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning once again to everybody. Joy and joy and joy to be with you on this Resurrection Sunday. Remember, remember when you are, um, when the weeks go forward, especially when we exit the Easter season, which is a while away yet, but it's important to remember this every Sunday of Easter, that every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every Sunday is a Sunday of the resurrection. So when you're not feeling well because it's just not as woohoo as it is on Easter Sunday, you just need to look inside for that that presence and companionship of the Holy Spirit, because it is Resurrection Sunday every Sunday. Easter is every Sunday. In fact, let's just go for the, go for the gold here. Really, resurrection is every moment. It's every moment that we think about the presence of Christ in our life. That's resurrection moment. There are lots of announcements here. I'm not going to go over all of them, but I am going to go over a couple of them because there are a couple of really important. We had a survey that went out. I hope everybody got that. We got a lot of those surveys returned. The survey was a question whether or not what we were going to do on Wednesday night as we transitioned from, from our Advent series to the, to the um, um, Christmas and then Lenten series. And we had the three options on there. There was a, a, some robust response to those three options. On top of the model that we had during Lent. It's different, it's the same, but it's different. And then you'll see on Wednesday night, we'll be doing a video study. So we're going to watch in one, and the first one will be the entire chosen together online. It is a 20 minute segment from start to finish. The other segments are longer. So we're gonna split those up in half, some of them in half, not all of them, they're short. And we're gonna watch that as, a, as an illustration of the biblical um, uh, story, the biblical witness, and then for the rest of that time, so this Wednesday night, it'll be uh, for about 40 minutes, 35 minutes. Uh, after we watch that video segment, look at the, uh, at the, at the uh, biblical lesson or lessons that are represented, and then the application and the effect of that lesson on us and how this, this video may have helped us in our process to ask something about ourselves and the presence of God that we have not had access to before. I can tell you and those of you who are involved in the program on in, during Lent that that was part of the of the of the participation of that Lenten program. Watching these different illustrations and the way they were portrayed opened new doors of 
encountering brings the scripture alive, which is what we try to do, isn't it? So I hope that you can come. Seven o'clock to seven fifteen is just a, a round a round table. I'm I seated my lawn. I had a my car broke down. I'm having a great time. My my grandchild child's birthday. Just a time to share. Seven fifteen to seven thirty. It's complex. It's right here in the book. Come and then seven thirty to eight thirty. We're going to be doing the Wednesday night program. It's a seven week program. We'll take it up to Pentecost. And that's half of these, uh, the first season of The Chosen. If we decide to go on, we can go for seven more weeks and finish the entire first season, or we can change at that point. But for right now, that is our program, and I hope to see you. Uh, you don't have to do anything but come. And I promise I won't point at you. Carol, what do you think? That if you want to volunteer what you're feeling and thinking, then you are welcome to it. I hope you feel because that's what helps us all grow, to hear that witness of our own a revelation in the voice of other people, our brothers and sisters, as we grow in Christ. The Thursday night Bible study this week, we have not chosen a book yet. So if you have not attended, or you have, but if you have not attended, you have not gone to this thing, and you decided, I'd like to, I would love to read Thessalonians, you should come on Thursday night and simply say, I'd like to read Thessalonians. And it could be, like it's happened in the past, the Holy Spirit just like races through the entire crowd, and suddenly everybody's going, yeah. Yeah, let's do Thessalonians, and there you go. But you know what won't happen if you're not there? That won't happen. So you won't get to hear, read, and study Thessalonians because you won't be there to suggest it, and we won't be able to do it either because we will have chosen something else. So you need to come on Thursday and tell us what you want and be a part of that so that we all can grow together in God's revelation through you to us. What a, what a blessing, what a blessing. So many other things. I know that there are announcements chafing, chafing to get ready to talk about it. we got Arts in the Park and Shrine Month coming. Did you want to say anything, Don? We're going to up for Arts in the Park. It's upon us next weekend, which is exciting. We've got a great uh, turnout. So I just want to, to, to assist if you are still interested. I am going to take the chart with me today. My phone, my number, if you don't have it, So call me if you're, if you're interested in help. And if you, if you didn't get that or you can't remember it, just call the church. Yes. And we will send you on to Don. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don. Thanks so much. Don, he's got, you know, a special bunt cake when he's done it, something like that, because it's just a lot, of, a lot of extra gift and ministry from him. Cake. All right. After my heart. Anything? to uh, Stokesville, of Stokesville fame in, in Virginia, on the other side of 81. Uh, uh, looked very much like Shrine Mount. Absolutely beautiful this time of year. The, the grass, I told Jenny to come back home, it looked like the hills of Ireland, those big wafting green hills. Really beautiful to be up at Shrine Mount this time of year and, and to just be away, just be there doing something different. If you do have questions, you haven't gone, please, please get a hold of somebody, anybody, and, and uh, specifically, that uh, remember that somebody wants to go money is not a problem we have a 
fund to make sure that people go. We made a promise to our parish family years and years and years ago. I can't remember how many, 15 or 20 years ago now, that said that, that nobody will be kept from Shrinemont because of money. So we have a scholarship fund. If you need that, just let me know. I have a really, really good memory to forget things. So you tell me that you need it and, then, and it goes to the process and then I never think about it again, I promise you. There's no stigma attached and it's just between you and the ether. So that's it, that's it, that's the end. Okay, and the last thing is, it is the 45th anniversary of MSEP. That is Me Mechanicsville Church's emergency function. We had the food closet here, it's now over there and it's a combination of the food closet. I met with Pat this week, he wanted to oh, give us a personal invitation to come, any of us to the, this, this um, to Redeemer at 11.30 on May 12th, uh, where lunch will be provided for a celebration. Um, I wish you'd reached out to me earlier because guess where MSEF started? Right here. When the Creator started MSEF, it was the suggestion to the churches of uh, Redeemer, Roman Catholic, and Messiah Lutheran at a meeting of those three churches during a Pentecost service that we combine and create MSEF to service the larger community as one group, and MSEF has grown from there. So we are celebrating really the, uh, the birth of MSEF. We're celebrating our birthday as we got together with, uh, with Redeemer and with Messiah to make MSEF possible. So if you can come to that, come on down because it's gonna be a good celebration for everybody. Uh, any other announcements? Ah, one more thing you may have noticed we're doing this morning. We are reading out of this thing, this weird thing. Look at that. What is that? I had a question about the prayer book a little while ago. I actually had somebody say to me, what's that really, what's that red book for? <laughs> so it occurred to me that we should get back into it. This is our heritage. This is where we came from. Uh, book of Common Prayer was, was uh, written first in uh, the 15, early 1540s. It was completed in 1549, again in 1552, and again in 1556. It's been updated. All members of the constituent uh, partners in the Anglican communion around the world have their own prayer books. I have several of them. They have wonderful stuff in them. Now, this is the, uh, our prayer book, wonderful prayer book. It came out in 1979. Many of, of other people, if you're an age-old Episcopalian like me, then you grew up with a 1928 prayer book, that blessed little one that you needed a magnifying glass to read. Uh, they have been trying to revise this thing for the last 15 years, and because of the upheaval in our culture and society, have yet to meet that deadline. I think they've reset the deadline about six times, seven times now. Uh, but we're going to get back into it for a while and get on these pages. So here's a little tip for you. When you come to church, you guys at home, you do the same thing with the online book of common prayer. Just Google that. It's right there. The whole book it's freeware. Or you can go to your closet, blow it off and pull it out and use the regular prayer book. Uh, when you come here or when you go there, you can open up your bulletin when you get here, like we used to do. Remember this? I used to do this. And we say, oh, look, the service starts on page 355. And then before anything else happens, well, Martha's playing the prelude. You open your prayer book, the 355. See, I've got a ribbon. Mine, mine's got a ribbon. So I go, oh, look, there it is. And then I just sit there and I wait. I put it on the pew right there. And then I sing the hymn. And then I put down that prayer, the, the hymnal. I pick it up. There we go. We're starting right off. So right now, while I am dressing the table for communion, you guys can grab your prayer book. And in your prayer book, because it says it right here, in your... it says that the Holy Spirit begins on page 361. So you just open that book, 61, put it beside you on the pew. And then when I say the Lord's Victory, you go and you're right on board. There is one difference for you guys at home, and that is that the post communion prayer has a few words that are different in it that may happen. The post-communion prayer that you can find in your prayer book, however, because it is in your prayer book, is on page 800, and where are we here? Sorry, I noticed that the page number is not in the, in the, in the, in the bulletin, which it should be. Sorry, sorry, guys, sorry, sorry. Come on, guys, turn on. 836, the Book of Common Prayer, the post communion Prayer. So we'll get to that. For you guys here, the post communion Prayer is in your bulletin. Okay? But you can still use the prayer book if you want. Otherwise, at home, 836 in the Book of Common Prayer. All right. Birthdays. Anniversaries. 
Let your light so shine. Let the peace of God that resides in you be the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. So live you to be a witness to Jesus Christ that all who see you will give glory to our Father. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly, we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true paschal lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed them, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
when we had fallen into sin, become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. Stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself with obedience to you will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. The night was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine. And when he had been thanked, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Resurrection and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of you, an unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And the last day, bring us with all your sins into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Christ, our pastor, is sacrificed for us. There we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Blood of Christ, the cup of Christ the bread of heaven. Body of Christ the bread of heaven. Body of Christ. 
Christ the bread of heaven. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ. Christ the bread of heaven. The body of Christ the bread of heaven. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ the bread of heaven. The body of Christ the bread of heaven. Let us pray. Accept, O oh Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts, and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit, that through the Holy Spirit, we may make Christ known, and through the Holy Spirit, at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. Now may the peace and the presence and the companionship and the gift of life in Christ fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always.
Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the risen Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah.